So now we return to our history of climate change science to early efforts to model the impacts of increasing carbon dioxide concentrations. First of all, we need some numbers. Increasing carbon dioxide and other forms of pollution are already today reducing outgoing infrared radiation by about two and a half watts per square meter. That's an old fashioned bicycle torch bulb or about double the average power consumption of a mobile phone in every square meter of the Earth's surface. That probably doesn't sound very much, but added up over the whole planet, it's 12 and a half million billion kilowatt hours per year, or about 60 times world primary energy consumption. Many people ask what happens to the energy released directly by the burning of fossil fuels, and this is the answer. It may impact local climate around a power station or a city, but this direct impact is completely dwarfed by the impact of waste greenhouse gases, primarily carbon dioxide, on climate. So the climate system is like a giant bathtub. The increase in greenhouse gases to date is adding an additional two and a half watts per square meter continuously, while an estimated one and three quarter watts per square meter is being emitted to space because of the about a degree of warming that's occurred already. So there's an imbalance, roughly three quarters of a watt per square meter, which must be accumulating somewhere in the climate system. This imbalance was first documented by Sidney Levitas and his co-workers in 2000, who showed that most of the energy was accumulating in the oceans and confirmed that the global energy budget was out of equilibrium. This equation represents how the global energy budget responds to an external disturbance like an increase in greenhouse gases, and it provides the conceptual framework we use to understand the climate system's response. Much of our understanding arises from the work of Stephen Schneider in the 1970s. Delta F here is the net energy imbalance due to changing external drivers, for example, the two and a half watts per square meter that's being trapped by greenhouse gas increases to date. Delta T is the warming relative to pre-industrial, while Delta Q is the rate of energy accumulation in the climate system, that's about three quarters of a watt per square meter. The delta F at two times CO2 is the energy imbalance due to a doubling of CO2, and dating back to the work of Arrhenius, this has been pretty well characterized as about 3.7 watts per square meter. And delta T, two times CO2, is the equilibrium warming due to doubling CO2. This is what's called the climate sensitivity. The terms lambda and mu are not things we can observe directly. They depend on how clouds, water vapor, sea ice, and so on, respond to rising temperature. Lambda may be constant over time, but mu certainly isn't, since it depends on how far the system is out of equilibrium. So without knowing what lambda and mu are, one way to estimate the impact of doubling CO2 is to represent all these relevant processes and feedbacks in a computer simulation, increase carbon dioxide, and see what happens. This was done by Suki Manabe and Richard Wetherald in the 1960s using a so-called single column model, which represents the entire atmosphere in terms of its spatial average behavior, only considering changes in height, in the height dimension. Then in 1975, they performed a much more challenging task of modeling the response with a three-dimensional so-called general circulation model. These three-dimensional climate models, which are variants of the models used for weather forecasting, get a lot of attention but you may have noticed they've come rather late in the day in this explanation of our understanding of the impact of CO2 on climate. They're one of our lines of evidence, but only one of many. Drawing on a range of lines of evidence, including the results of these early general circulation model experiments, the 1979 National Academy of Sciences panel, chaired by Jules Charney, gave a range of one and a half to four and a half degrees for the equilibrium warming on doubling carbon dioxide concentrations. And in words that I strongly suspect can be traced to Carl Wunsch, they also noted that the oceans could delay the estimated warming for several decades. And they specifically drew attention to the fact that as a result, it might be some time before the impact of rising carbon dioxide was detectable in the surface temperature record. So the situation at the end of the 1970s was somewhat analogous to a doctor detecting an increasing virus load in a patient's bloodstream before the patient develops a fever. The authors of the Charney Report 
gave this broad range for climate sensitivity and gave equal weight to either end of that range. While they might have considered a 1.5 degree warming to be relatively harmless, although more recent research might assert otherwise, it was certainly accepted at that time and has been ever since that a warming in the range of 4.5 to 5 degrees would be globally catastrophic. Those are words from an industry assessment from 1980. So it's a bit like a doctor detecting the increasing virus load, knowing there's a one in three chance the patient actually might be resistant, but that there's an equal chance of a catastrophic illness, and also knowing that if they wait until the fever appears to see if the patient's resistant, it'll be too late to avoid the complications. As evidence that it wasn't necessary to wait for a detectable signal before making predictions, here's a figure from a report by William Nordhaus, an economist from Yale, showing the impact of sustained fossil fuel use from 1975 onwards. He used a very simple model, but it was informed by the results from Minabe, Schneider and others. This paper was, to my knowledge, the first time that two degrees was proposed as a reasonable upper limit for human-induced warming, representing Nordhaus's assessment of the limit of temperature fluctuations over the past 100,000 years. When this forecast was made, temperatures had been stable or even declining for a couple of decades. But knowing what was happening to carbon dioxide, knowing that the virus load was going up, so to speak, Nordhaus went ahead and predicted a substantial warming starting in 1980. If we plot observed temperatures right up to the present day, that little spike you see at the end there is 2016, on exactly the same scale, we see that his prediction was remarkably accurate, confirming it was not necessary and nor, as the Charlie report concluded, necessarily wise, to wait until the warming was detectable before predicting what was going to happen next. This brings us to the fourth part of our tutorial, research quantifying the link between increasing carbon dioxide concentrations and global temperatures.